Bueno, eh, buenas tardes. Eh, como saben, es un encuentro con Celine Condorel. La en general este tipo de encuentros nos encantaría poder tenerlos en la sala, pero no está de más. Eh, no creo que haga falta explicar porque finalmente creemos que lo, que lo conveniente era que el encuentro tuviese lugar aquí, pero que, que afortunadamente tuviese lugar porque era algo okay. que. Ah. Bueno, la posibilidad de encontrarnos con Selin, eh, con Selin Condorelli, eh, era algo que no, no teníamos claro casi hasta, hasta ayer que final, finalmente eh, llegó. La idea de trabajar con Selin Condorelli nace durante el fotonoviembre, la decimocuarta edición de fotonoviembre, o la decimotercera, perdón, edición de fotonoviembre en 2017, con un trabajo de Selin que se llamaba la batalla del centro, la batalla del centro que precisamente contaba un poco el proceso de, de construcción o el proceso de diseño del centro Pompidou y que curiosamente hacía eco con otro trabajo que también mostrábamos en ese fotonoviembre de, de Gordon Mata Clark, en los que de, de, de maneras distintas ambos ambas eh, eh, abordaban el peso de la arquitectura, el significado de la arquitectura, pero también el significado de las instituciones culturales. En el modo en que, hemos, eh, en que llevamos pensando el centro en los últimos años, hemos intentado, con éxito o sin éxito, abrir un debate eh, sobre qué es una institución, qué sentido tiene una institución museística en, en Canarias, en qué modo podemos construir una institución desde, desde la base, la colección, repensar por qué y para qué tenemos centro. Y creíamos que todo ese tipo de cuestiones estaban muy presentes en el en el trabajo de Selin Condorelli, tanto la idea de arquitectura, pero también la idea de tiempo de ocio, y eso es algo que está muy presente en, en, en esta exposición, en dos años de, de vacaciones, pero también eh, si las instituciones, eh, si el modo en que entendíamos la cultura como elemento de ocio, no como elemento de automancipación, que es la, la idea que nos gustaría o que al menos a mí como, como director me interesa del centro, es decir, cómo la, cómo la cultura, cómo un centro museístico, cómo la arquitectura de ese centro po podría ser un elemento de autoemancipación para la, para la ciudadanía, eh, era algo que nos parecía que se daba en el trabajo de Selin Condorelli y era algo eh, que a través del trabajo de Selin, que a través del trabajo de la exposición podíamos poner sobre la mesa, y al menos yo entiendo que así ha sido, con una exposición. Nada, les dejo con Selin, que realmente va a ser como una breve descripción de su trabajo, pero también de, de, de la propia eh, descripción. Daros las gracias. Dar las gracias a Estefanía, eh, Bruna, que fue un poco, ahora que tenemos esa posibilidad, que fue la que realmente fue las manos de, de Celine durante el proceso de, de montaje de esta exposición a través de Skype. Y nada, esperemos que disfrutemos. Al final, si les parece, abrimos un turno de preguntas si, si alguien tiene cuestiones o, o si no. Gracias. Gracias. Um, I'm sorry, I will continue in English, but I really like the Spanish with a French translation while I speak English. I think the speaking in three languages is very nice. Um, uh, thank you for coming. You're very spaced out. Um, thanks to Gilberto for inviting me until Until even just a couple of days ago, we weren't sure that I was going to be able to come. And it's a real privilege to be able to travel in this moment. And also for me to come and see my own work that I could not install in presence, but had to install remotely. So I, it's also an opportunity to thank everybody for the work, the sort of extraordinary work right, that, that was done to make it possible. Um, So the title of this talk and the title of the exhibition is Dos Años de Vacaciones, Two Years Vacation. Deux ans de vacances was the original title of a book by Jules Verne, which I've never read, uh, that uh, I found uh, in, a, in a bookshop in southern France while I was on holidays with some friends, and this, the title stuck with me for this idea of a time after work when I could take two years off. So for a number of years, I was kind of daydreaming about the idea of two years vacation. 
two years holiday, the sort of um, an idea of you know vacation comes from being unoccupied, from the Latin, an emptiness, uh, leaving the occupation, leaving the work behind. Uh, I really like this idea of being after occupied, post occupied, rather than being preoccupied, which is what so many of us seem to spend our time doing. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about free time, uh, probably because I have none, like I suspect most of you. Um, it's also a very strange period uh, to think about the relationship between work and non-work, when so many people had to work at home and some of the last protected spaces from work have been occupied. Uh, so I start with this, oh no, hang on, I have also double computer, which I have to remember. So I start with this, uh, this is a lounger, I think it's called the Transatlantique. It was a, an armchair designed by Eileen Gray. Uh, it was inspired by the deck chairs that used to be on cruise ships or transatlantic boats that would cross the Atlantic from the United States, or from America at least, uh, to Europe. The chair evokes long journeys at sea and a relaxing space outside work, which is also um, the space for recovering, for example, from uh, illnesses. Those chairs were I mean, the chair that this refers to are, is the same typology, whether it was on boats or on, for example, Swiss clinics by lakes, where people would recover from pulmonary diseases throughout the 19th century. This particular chair was designed by Eileen Gray, very famous designer, originally Irish, who worked in France. She designed it for her own house in the south of France, in Cap Martin. Um, it was made in 1927 for the terrace of this holiday home. Now, the, the deck chair, which I'm sure you're incredibly familiar with as a typology, is a piece of furniture that was reinterpreted many times. Um, it's associated with leisure. You find it on the beach, in public parks, especially in the UK. There's always um, deck chairs in parks. And uh, the combination of leisure and health with this treatment of pulmonary disease, especially tuberculosis, I think. So I, I find this piece of furniture reflects two really modern concerns, um, leisure and health, and how they are connected. Um, the lounger became a 20th century design classic, both on land and at sea. Um, so I've worked with the lounger in different ways. Of course, culture and leisure have been intertwined as concepts, as ideas for quite a long time. It's impossible to enjoy culture um, outside a time freed from work. Um, we also know that the genesis of the labor movement as a political subject occurred exactly, exactly in this struggle to free time from work. So the idea of the eight-hour working day um, came through a struggle of labor for what we today called free time, tempo libero, fright sight. Um, the, also the freed time, right? The time that had to be freed from work and exploitation. However, visiting a museum or encountering art happens exactly in those hours that are taken, carved, or extracted, perhaps. The hours that count as free. So that in an ideal, I mean, I don't know if it's a norm, but it's definitely an ideal of a eight hours work, eight hours free time, and eight hours sleep, which very few of us manage to obtain. However, 
I, as an artist, make work for parents and children at weekends or people in that free time. So there's an interesting, for me, position that is somehow at contrast with the fact that anybody who works in culture, their work takes place in the free time of others. I mean, obviously, everybody who works in the bar business or cinema or music is also in this strange contradiction. I mean, there's obviously uh, lots of advantages to that. Um, and those eight hours, they're not necessarily eight, but that free time is supposed to be the time, not just for culture, but also the time for social relations, for idleness, for family, for love. Um, um, and of course, the reality of it is that free time is often dominated by other forms of exploitation like domestic work. But perhaps that's another story. So I follow a line that mirrors the history of work to the history of leisure as a negative or perhaps as a mirror. This idea of free time does not exist without our concept of work. And yet, I was wondering if it was possible to look at it as a positive. You know, something that one works towards, an idea of a certain amount of freedom. Uh, and how it is that artists or art, museums, cultural institutions can contribute to its constitution. What's the responsibility that one has towards that free time when you work? within it. Um, OK, so I mean, this is how I've structured the talk. There's like notes to things that I hope construct some kind of an argument and that have some logic. Uh, this is a, just a, a fragment of uh, an artwork by Hans Hacke called Photographic Notes from Documenta 2, the second Documenta in 1959. I mean, it's maybe his first work, in a way. So it's a series of 26 black and white photographs, which were taken at Documenta, where Hans Hacke was working. He was a student at the time. Um, he was a student in the art school at Kassel. I think he was only a first or second year student. And it was his summer job um, to be a gallery attendant in, you know, what is considered a really uh, important, large confrontation of the German public with uh, modern and contemporary art. Uh, obviously, it includes works by artists such as Mondrian, Pollock, Kandinsky. But the subject of these images is obviously not the paintings or the artworks, but the public themselves, right? In the center, the foreground is how people spend time in this exhibition. And in some ways, you know, also for an artist who was so young at the time, he was already outlining the subject of work that he would spend his entire life looking at, which is somehow how people encounter art rather than just looking at the art without the human aspect of it. So that an exhibition in these photographs already emerges as a social space in which relationships are established. It's quite strange to see, I think, no? To see how public the public kind of behaves, especially that picture there on the left. Like, I mean, he's obviously resting his head on the painting, which is something that is quite difficult to see, it would be quite difficult to do in most exhibitions. I'm never sure whether it's a sign of love, of closeness and intimacy, or whether it's the opposite, whether it's testing, banging your head against something. But um, something that I particularly like, I mean, this is a really bad uh, close-up, but something that really interests me is this, you know, the object that shares its space with the artworks, where everybody's sitting, right? So it's not an artwork in itself, it's a museum bench. But obviously, this is an object that is in the exhibition. Um, 
that has a very particular function and in some ways forms that encounter between people and the artwork. So, so I've worked with museum benches quite a lot, again, as a typology of you know, the thing in the room that is not supposed to be a work, but is also, as the case may be, an artwork by myself. Um, the, the art apparatus, as we know, views the spectator not really as a body, but just as an eye, um, a disembodied eye, so associated with the mind somehow, so that it's very rarely an actual body that might feel warm or tired or, um, you know, whose material ground has a, um, a real location with needs and limitations. So uh, these are photographs from uh, an installation that um, I made at the Albertinum in Dresden, in Germany, which included researching the history of benches that had been used in the museum through time. Of course, not being part of the collection, they rarely are kept, uh, except by mistake or in somebody's house or because they've just been left in storage, and uh, reupholstering them, as well as rehanging part of the collection at a different height, so that it would be seating height. So um, this particular room was, is, it's still there, <laughs> with paintings by Ferdinand von Reisky. They're all hung at children's height, so much, much lower than the rest of the collection. Children's height is also the height when you're sitting, obviously. Um, but of course, flirting, playing, eating, drinking, laughing and napping, activities that are suitable for the public park but are not allowed inside of the museum, in fact are completely forbidden in the museum already from the 19th century, uh, Western history is one of ocular centrism, as I'm sure we know, so vision and vision alone somehow counts and is completely disassociated from a material body. So the rational man, the idea of rationality and the rational man that we inherited from modernism is always represented alone and standing. Six. Okay, to exhibit means to expose, to show, to demonstrate. So implicit in any notion of, exhi of exhibition, the idea of an exhibition is that somebody needs to be there somehow, at least potentially, uh, those to be exposed, shown, or demonstrated to, which means that it is, first of all, that public aspect that characterizes what an exhibition is, and that allows them to qualify space as public. Uh, these are fragments of uh, an installation for the Guangzhou Biennial in 2016. Seven. So the exhibition in the way that we understand it today as things arranged in a temporary public display is a modern form of communication that was developed in the second half of the 19th century. It's an idea of a format that is capable of reaching very big audiences, more or less at the same time, so that exhibitions were developed as sites of discovery and learning, with the idea of fascinating or even shocking large audiences. This is um, a painted engraving from the great exhibition of works of industry of all nations organized by Prince Albert in 1851 in London with the explicit purpose of making clear to the world Great Britain's role as an industrial leader. In the Universal Exhibition of 1867, the central part of the exhibition was on labor, on work. And uh, for the, so before the public opening, um, the employers who had provided some of the machines that were being shown 
had invited the trades delegates, or like the union representatives, to come and see this amazing spectacle of machinery. So um, the idea was obvious that it was demonstrating machines that would make, be able to make the work cheaply and effortlessly so that fewer workers were needed. As a, one of the delegates remarked, um, there was a contrast between um, this amazing spectacle of the machines and the idea of uh, moral and material poverty of the workers themselves. This is the plan of that uh, imperial exhibition, but I don't know if you can actually read it. So the very first circle is on labor. So the center of the exhibition, the great exhibition, is the idea of work, putting work on display. Right? The idea of exhibiting the machines of capitalism as a background, uh, almost as a trick uh, that would mean that the workers were somehow not needed anymore. So the reason why I'm talking about this is that I really wondered if there was... So this was always taught to me. I mean, I didn't go to art school, but this was always taught to me as a... Sorry, I've gone too fast. As what the genealogy of exhibitions was. You know, this is where exhibitions come from. The salon, the great exhibition. And considering how much this is a spectacle of dispossession, I was wondering if, within this conversation on work and free time, there was another genealogy that I could make for myself. So what I mean, another history of the display of culture that would not go through the spectacle of dispossession of the great exhibition. I wondered um, where to find it. I mean, I wondered where to find it in a way that I was also already trying to practice. So. Um, this is number nine. It's uh, um, an exhibition that I made in Leipzig in 2014 that finished in 2018 because I proposed that instead of doing an exhibition, I would make a museum cafe. A uh, museum cafe in which... So the museum cafe appears in a novel, and then every part of it, the benches, the cups, the upholstery, the wallpaper, the table. They're all artworks, but they're also just parts of the cafe. So that you could, or one could, go and see the exhibition, or one could just go and have a coffee and totally ignore the artworks. Ah, this was an animated GIF, but it doesn't work. OK. <laughs> So, so back to my question of a different history of exhibitions to root myself on, obviously. I was wondering, what would that history look like? Would it include the workers' clubs, or the cultural houses, or um, institutions of leisure dedicated to a culture of working people? You know, as I'm sure you're all aware, the Soviet Union had a very rich uh, history of workers' clubs that spread after the October Revolution. Um, the idea was to uh, make buildings that would entirely uh, occupy the free time of workers, also by providing services. So. Um, there were almost 200 independent organizations that have half a million participants. This is one of the most famous ones, the Rusakov one, um, which I think was built in 1926 by Melnikov. Um, there's very few images that survive of what was going on inside. And as part of my question, I was wondering what those programs were. Um, I found much, quite a lot of material about this in a text by a writer called Anna Bokov that describes the basic club program with the following elements. A foyer with a cloakroom, auditorium, recreation room, library and reading room, classrooms administration, children's playroom, occupiable roof and exterior terraces. So 
The club contains spaces for things on display, like theatrical or musical performances, and also spaces for personal reflection. Some of them would contain laundry rooms, as well as uh, children's uh, occupational rooms, so childcare, and somewhere where you could do some of the domestic labor. Um, I've only ever seen one art space, contemporary art space, that did that. There is, um, there is a small Konstal in uh, Stockholm called Konstal C that uh, was founded by an artist whose name I can't remember, who, that has a laundry and a little exhibition space next door. So you go and do your washing and put it all in the washing machine, and the shows always take about 45 minutes, which I really... Uh, that's kind of my ideal as, a, as an institution. Um, so back to that idea of uh, the exhibition as a spectacle of dispossession, there's another question it raises, which is the question, what would the equivalent form of expropriation be today? Um, what happens when I go and see an exhibition of large works in a sort of world-famous museum, and whether there are other ways of making exhibitions? I mean, you know, a lot of my work, I have tried to tackle this idea between putting something on display and actually, as a member of an audience, being exposed to something that is happening. So that is the reason why, um, you know, you, I tried it in different ways. So this is actually an image of uh, an artwork that contains a conference on institutions. So it's a format as well as an object. It's called All Our Tomorrows. I think I'm in there somewhere, actually. Um, it was commissioned by the Luma Foundation as they were actually building uh, their museum research space in the south of France, in Arles. And uh, my proposal was, again, trying to not just put an object in the middle of a room that people would have to look at, but creating a site for something to happen, in this case, a conversation about what institutions should be. Uh, it's a work from 2016. Here you have some, how it somehow frames. And then another important reference for me, which is the Sesc Pompeia by Lina Bobardi, which opened in 1982 in Sao Paulo. It's an architectural complex and a leisure center. Um, open for the local population. It, it's kind of used as a, as a model or as an example of a democratic cultural institution, uh, meaning that it's open to everybody. Now, I, I have actually been there, and it's not actually open to everybody, meaning you don't see homeless people in the SESC, but you do see people of all ages who live in the neighborhood who use it. Um, there is, uh, I think, an idea that is quite powerful that comes through it, which is a sort of horizontal uh, program, so there is no hierarchy. There's incredibly interesting uh, video exhibitions and the swimming pool next door and dance, uh, contemporary dance being put up on display and sports centers. The idea is that all of these activities happen at the same time. You might go from one to the other without any notion of a hierarchy. There's no cultural value that is attached to one thing and not another, uh, which I think is uh, very inspiring, but also, I think, provides quite an interesting example to look back at the museum and, in a way, what's missing. Um, other examples, I mean, another one that I've looked at quite a lot, but uh, the, the first, so this was a painting for the proposal of the Louvre uh, when it was designed for the king, right, for the king's collection in Paris, um, which is not what happened. Within two years of the building uh, being on site, the French Revolution happened, and the Louvre was reappropriated by the revolution as the palace, uh, now I don't remember what the, the monument dedicated to the love and study of the arts. 
belonging to the common man and woman of the new republic. Why is this interesting to me? It's because um, uh, when, it, when the, the museum first opened after the French Revolution, the calendar was a 10-day calendar rather than a seven-day calendar. And the museum was open five days a week for artists so that they could learn. Uh, artists were in residence. They could live in the museum. Uh, three days for the general public and two days for cleaning. I love the idea of a museum that is also a support structure for artists so that, of course, that's where they live. They have a place to live as well as a place to work. And also, in the early days of the Louvre, of course, you could eat, drink, sleep in the museum. Prostitution was allowed, and there was no artificial lighting. So I love thinking of this kind of utopian moment of a museum that would be entirely inhabited, like a street, right, with everyday life. I mean, of course, this didn't last very long. And apparently, the museum fell into disrepair and was closed after five years. When it was reopened, it was reopened with, of course, no prostitution, no eating and drinking, and also the Galleria Progressiva, which means the entire collection ordered from the past to the present with an idea of progress, right, that you walk towards the future. 14. Um, so this is something about the furniture and plants, and the idea of inhabitation and how um, one often uses house plants as a way of domesticating space, even domesticating institutional space, right? Offices will have house plants, sometimes museums, not usually. Um, um, the, the, the culture of having houseplants inside uh, is not that old. It comes, obviously, from a history of colonialism and specifically a sort of Victorian moment when um, houses have big enough windows so that, and are warm enough so that subtropical plants would be able to survive inside. The museums were often decorated with plants in a way that seems almost impossible to think about today, while all signs of inhabitation, all signs of comfort, in fact, have been gradually taken out of the museum, and with them the acknowledgement that there's anything else except the oculocentrism, the vision, vision alone, a visual experience of culture that should prevail. Um, so, these are actually pages from a, a small artist book that I made that looked at the relationship between plants and exhibitions. Um, specifically, I used the archive of photographs of exhibitions at MoMA in New York. The only reason I used that archive is because it's entirely online. So you see exhibition photographs from as long as they started taking exhibition photographs. And what I found was that from the 30s to the as late as the late 70s, actually, there were plants inside exhibitions, all subtropical. So all plants that would find themselves at home here, but obviously not in New York. Uh, and within these you know, hundreds and hundreds of photographs, it comes out that there's only six species that were used. They're all really hardy, subtropical plants, very familiar, like Monstra Deliciosa. So I decided to try and do like a history of, you know, like an art history of plants. Of course, they're never mentioned, right? They're not in the catalog, they're not in the exhibition shot. And yet, they're like really funny. I think like this alocasia peeking out of a Mark Rothko. Um, so houseplants started appearing in middle-class interiors of course, in the Victorian area, era, but they also started disappearing from the museum as insurance policies became really important, because the problem with having plants next to expensive artworks is that the plants has all sorts of things with it, life, you know, insects, moisture, that make the insurance policy not valid, because you need a protected environment 
um, to protect the artwork, right? which is, I think, also another interesting reversal that artworks would need to be protected from life, from humans, from anything alive in the room, which, of course, in the case of Rothko, uh, is just because they are so expensive. OK, I go back to Lina Bobardi. This is actually a quote from her uh, on a drawing. Museums should contain a collection, popular art, and a playground with no hierarchy. This is apparently something that she said in relationship to the museum that she built in Sao Paulo called the MASPI, Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo. Um, and this is a building that I used in relationship to the history of plants that Lina Bobardi designed. Um, the reason why I used this building is that it was entirely built in situ, cast in situ, uh, around an existing mango tree. So, as you know, much of the shape of the building is given by the existing site, and of course, casting concrete in situ is quite difficult and quite labor intensive. So, I use this relationship between the MoMA history of plants and the uh, Koti, which the first name of restaurant Koti was actually Zanzibar, um, to look at the history, or to look at the relationship between plants and um, uh, exhibitions. From that came a series of artworks. You see fragments of them here. Uh, this is an image of an East End flower show as recorded in the Day of Rest for 1873. It was held in a local church hall in East London. What you see on the right is part of the construction technique for the culture center and restaurant that I just described, Restaurant Coti, designed by Lina Bobardi in the north of Brazil, in Salvador de Bahia. And me using that construction technique to make a series of artworks that are somehow part of its, the process of making the original restaurant. So this kind of corrugated metal used to cast concrete, I just used the corrugated met, uh, plastic, actually it's fiberglass, to make these uh, room dividers that draw in space part of the curves in the original building uh, Baliana Bobardi that I've never been able to see because it's been closed since the 80s. Uh, I tried on three different occasions and never managed to get in there. Uh, so in some ways, I think this is a model, or at least a model of a fragment of a building. Um, and number 18 is a sculpture garden that came out of that series that uh, I made as an outdoor exhibition in Australia, in Brisbane, uh, an institution called the Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane. Uh, I think a little bit clearer to go through the building site. I mean, you know, I, I do consider this to be an exhibition, but obviously it goes through an entirely different production process than uh, the exhibition that you see downstairs. But within this relationship, between public space and exhibitions, sculpture gardens, gardens, gardens as exhibition, making a sculpture garden as an artwork or a permanent exhibition was a step. Uh, this incomprehensible page, but I quite like it, is all the different steps of that process. Making a model on the left with a fragment an actual model of a garden, which then becomes a sculpture garden, and then the positive of that is another sculpture, using very much uh, the technique that I found in Zanzibar. This became another series of artworks, again, called Zanzibar, as a sort of winter garden. This is in King's Cross in London. King's Cross is a big station in London. Uh, which exists as a model, still retracing a particular history of plants as they appear, 
through the history of contemporary art. Uh, I think that's my last image. Um, I would be happy to take any questions, if you have any, in whatever language. Uh, what language are you going to ask the question? Uh, well, the fact is, the translator needs to understand me, so... Eh, la idea, bueno, yo querría un poco preguntarte sobre la exposición de la planta baja, ¿no? sobre dos años de vacaciones, sobre todo la, la, la pieza de Brisolet o Limits to Play, si quieres un poco explicar sobre esas dos piezas y cómo esas dos piezas se encuentran en, en la sala. I'll answer in English. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, I, I, I got the French translation. Uh, yeah, I didn't actually talk about any works that are in the exhibition. Um, so, totally fair. Um, okay, I'll start with uh, Brice Soleil. So, Brice Soleil is, an, is a new work, uh, which is, it looks like the sort of fabric shades that you might use on the beach or outside shops. Um, uh, that is the first room that you enter the exhibition through downstairs. Um, it's using awning fabric. So it's literally fabric that is sold for shop awnings. Um, and uh, relates very much to, uh, to my interest in curtains and room dividers sort of the sort of soft architecture that structures space and creates boundaries on top of architecture, right? So not made out of concrete or bricks and mortar. Um, so one of the reasons I'm interested in this is that within my interests in architecture, um, curtains, uh, blinds, um, these, these, these kinds of objects are uh, usually not part of an architectural project. I mean, except in this building, actually, there's a lot of curtains. But um, often uh, they're not. Uh, there's an idea of curtains that resides within a sort of traditionally feminine history, right? The furnishing, the soft furnishing would be relegated to women as you know, the, the sort of last bit of inhabitation. They relate very much to the idea of plants and indoor plants, I think. To make somewhere habitable, you put something soft in it. Um, and yet they are so important to structure uh, the inhabitation of space, right? So curtains separate public from private, inside, outside, night and day. You draw the curtains at night. Um, and uh, that, I think, as a, as a typology, almost like a vocabulary, is what interests me. Uh, so, Brice Soleil is, is partly... Um, so, Brice Soleil means uh, breaking the sun. It's a French term that uh, came, I think, from Le Corbusier, uh, when he made kind of rigid, um, usually diagonal, walls in front of windows to avoid having direct sunlight entering a space. So it breaks the sun and articulates also light. Um, so there's, there's something about that work that really looks like it should be outdoors, just a transposition between something that is outside being put inside, also gives it this weird atmosphere of holidays. Right? It looks like a beach thing. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't actually planning for that to happen, but it really does. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know, what else can I say about it? That it's attached to some rocks that were found with great love and patience that come from the island, so in some ways it is directly attached to a topographical piece of the island. Um, and 
I mean, the reason why it's in that room is that it is the first room that you come into, and therefore the room that has the most outside feeling to it, whereas everything that relates purely to work is all the way inside in the very last room. So it was also a way of structuring uh, the exhibition from leisure to work, outside to inside, thinking that work is the most abstracted part. Abstracted, I mean, where everything's taken out. You have no relationship to the outside anymore. That's just one half of the question. <laughs> Second half of the question is limits to play. So limits to play uh, takes uh, sports lines that are made for uh, sports lines, basically, for uh, playing things. Uh, I mean, it's actually, weirdly, it's a, it's a piece that does relate to Cesc Pompeia by Lina Bobardi. If within the leisure center, some of the ways that you can read what the spaces are used for is because of the sports lines on the floor, which, again, just like the curtain, very simple, very small gestures that structure what, where you can stand, what you can do. You know, it's almost like a choreography of space that happens through sports lines. And um, they're all overlapped. And they're all the games that uh, were forbidden for women to play in public until a certain quite late date in the 20th century. The last one is 1974, and it's uh, for pétanque, boule. Uh, so 1974 is the first time that there was a competition of this game in which women were allowed to participate, which seems incredible to me. It's the year I was born, and it seems incredible to me that it would take quite so long. Uh, I think the first one is tennis. So again, lines that describe boundaries, both spatial and social, between things. But it is also the way that I used to structure the exhibition and display parts of the collection, so that within what is inside and outside, playing and labor uh, is literally put on top of this work. Does that answer the question? The problem with masks is that you can't tell when somebody's smiling. <laughs> Uh, microphone. Sí, la idea sería un poco eh, en esa idea también de, de diseño de museo, ¿no? La, la idea de um, estructurar las instituciones. Sé que quizás es una pregunta un tanto comprometida, pero ¿cuál es tu visión de hacia dónde deberían ir las instituciones? Precisamente lo hablábamos hoy, ¿no? Esta idea de cómo los museos se convierten en, eh, en ese espacio donde mostrar todo el éxito económico, pero que por otro lado tienen una relación totalmente perversa muchas veces con los artistas, con los curadores, eh, hacia dónde, incluso con el propio personal, ¿no? ¿Cuál sería el espacio, cómo deberían diseñarse las eh, estructuras museísticas en el futuro, hacia dónde deberían ir o cuál es tu perspectiva? Tampoco pretendo una, que des una solución, simplemente <risa> poner un, una idea. Um, well, that's a tricky one. Um, I mean, first of all, the reason why this interests me is that this is the space in which I work, right? I work largely in public institutions like museums or art centers. So what I'm describing is both existing conditions and the conditions in which I would like to work, right? Because I think inherent in any exhibition uh, is a proposal, right? A proposition for the kind of things you would like to do, the kind of things you would like to see, and the way in which you would like to live. You know, any exhibition is always uh, made by a group of people 
for other groups of people, but those groups are not necessarily that separate. You know, that's one of the reasons why it was important to me to put the credits of everyone who contributed to the exhibition outside the door, so that you know it's got my name on it, but I didn't do it on my own. Nobody works alone. So I think that is both an interest and the beginning of an answer, because uh, I think it is still possible to encounter culture as a collective endeavor, right? In which there is an agreement between audiences and workers, because they are not separate, but the work or culture, let's say, is made uh, through a social, political, financial interaction. So um, I think artists, but also cultural producers in general, contribute to that and help constitute that. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying this is for everybody. Huh? Also, it's not for every museum. It's not for every artist, for, for sure. This is something I'm interested in. And where I think the, uh, you know, the work of the artist and the work of the institution also meet. You know, that's partly my interest. You know, that I've, I'm really interested in public culture and what that might mean in the future. Um, so I think that's a very important aspect of it. You know, encountering the institution as a social context in which relationships are formed. Um, and then for the rest, you know, like, I mean, it's not exactly an answer, but I definitely look a lot to lessons from the past to think of how to, uh, how to work. Uh, I think it's interesting how so many radical examples inhabit the past, whether it's Lina Bobardi or, you know, even looking at, you know, Le Louvre, you know, like the most quintessentially conservative museum, and think that this at some point was a radical example of what public culture might be, and why can't these experiments happen again? Of course they do, and they do in a temporary way, right? Something exists maybe for two years or three years or four years, and that's already quite a lot. Um, and in this way, I think culture is formed and continues, but it's not really an answer. It's just an interest, let's say. But I do believe that interests converge so that um, you meet and end up working with people who have similar questions um, at some point. Does anybody else have a question? Or is it just the director? <laughs> I, I am also interested in the way you um, propose to work with the collection of the museum. Um, you always explain this thing about this also an, an affectional way to get connected with some of the works. So I think it's something I, I would like to hear now, I mean, a little bit more about this idea of how you were interested on those works, like uh, Marino Gonier, but other people that you never know that in many ways we're connected to your work or the way you understand images or work or things like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's two things, actually. You know, first of all, it connects to this uh, idea that is really important to me, that you don't work alone and I don't want to work alone, so that I enter a space in which an incredible number of people have already contributed. There's all the people who were there before me who have left no trace, and there's all the people who are still present through their labor in the form of the museum, and in this case, also the form of a collection. So that is something that I think is, you know, not just important to me as a way to work, but also as a way to show, right? So that you don't just enter uh, a sort of a purified space in which everything has been removed, but you enter a space in which relationships are taking place. But then it's also, uh, a way of domesticating the institution, right? So I, again, I come in or I enter uh, this museum. You know, this was a museum I'd never been to because I couldn't even do a site visit. So 
the way that I entered it was through the collection that is online. And this collection is not just a number of objects, it's a number of people and practices. For me, it is very much so, because I'm one artist amongst other artists. In this collection, I happen to have friends, some people that I know personally that are important to me. But then there's other people whose work I've maybe been looking at for a very long time and therefore have a friendship of sorts with them. Obviously, they're not friends with me. They've been dead for a long time or not. But there is a relationship there between practices. And I think uh, you know, part of my interest is to uh, cultivate those relationships and somehow also display them. So uh, making it explicit that the museum is a social context, making it explicit that there is the work of so many others who came before me, and in my own way of working, continuing those relationships towards the future. So for example, Marie Nugonier that uh, Gilberto mentioned is a very dear friend of mine. Uh, I've known her for a long time. She lives in London. Uh, well, actually, no, she lives in Paris. But I was surprised to meet her work. And it was like a meeting. You know, you, you click on a picture, and you're like, oh, you're here. You know, there's, there's something absolutely uh, tangible about that as a way of approaching a collection that I think is often missing. Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you, you, you did a great job, so... It's, um, no, actually, um, I, I'm really also interested in the way you approach the work of uh, Alan Sekula, because we were working about that work and how it was related to the Lumiere film, this idea of getting out of the factory, that it was also in the Alan Sekula work. But it's also this idea that there's no anymore uh, this kind of work. I mean, you, mm. you, you, you talked before about that. But I also, um, I'm this, also this idea of new laborism, this idea of being creative, being creative all the time, right? I, especially in London and this stuff. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that or, or you have to say enough. Or, <laughs> or, or. No, I mean, there's something about the Alan Sekula that I think is interesting. The, so these are... There, there should be slides, but it's actually on a digital projection, but there are stills, and they're in the very last room where... Uh, so my work is a sort of seating structure from which you see the work. So you're sitting on the artwork to see the other artworks. And it's a, a sequence of stills of workers leaving a factory. I think it's the factory where his father worked, where Alan Sikula's father worked, where he also briefly worked at some point. Yeah, it's mostly guys, of course, you know, walking out, looking or not looking at the camera. And if you take the position that I was trying to describe, if you're standing in the free time, right, you're seeing an exhibition at the weekend on Saturday afternoon, that's where they're going, right? They're leaving work and they're going to that promised space of the freed time from labor. What happens in that space is not clear also because the freedom that they describe is, of course, extremely exclusive. There's hardly any women. They're almost all white. There's all sorts of work that is not represented by that representation of labor that should be also in the free time. But if you're not free from something, then what's free? So those questions about whether it's possible to talk about free time today and what that corresponds to if the idea of labor is so exclusive and confused. For me, we're incredibly clear in staging that work. So my work is what you sit on while you're looking at people leaving the factory. Uh, <laughs> it's all structure. <laughs> <somehow>. <laughs> So, uh, if there, si no hay ninguna otra pregunta, if there's no any question, which okay. don't there's no more, questions. no more questions. I mean, I'm, I'm available also outside more informally. Okay, um, so thank you so much. Thank uh, you. It was great. <laughs>